Good morning. This will be our Sunday school study um, for Sunday, July 26, 2020. Uh, we're in Revelation 18 this week. Last week we were zoomed in on uh, end, times, end Times Babylon, which we saw uh, was a, a picture of false religion that is seen riding on the back of the seven-headed red beast a beast that it seems to that seems to be representative of both the antichrist and his kingdom today we're going into chapter 18 and it carries on with this subject so let's start with the first two verses there and after these things i saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory and he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. What we have here is a picture of complete destruction. These verses do not tell us the why of Babylon's destruction. Um, they describe what becomes of it because of God's destructive uh, judgment. Uh, it was commonly thought in ancient times that when a city crumbled to ruins and was absolutely uninhabitable, that demons inhabited the place. A hateful bird, uh, that's a strange translation, is that it, it speaks of a bird of prey, uh, all of which were considered unclean by the Old Testament law. Uh, similar language to this is uh, used to describe the destroyed state of historical Babylon in Isaiah 13 and also in Jeremiah 50. So John's original readers would have understood this imagery to speak of the absolute destruction of Babylon. It is verse 3 that gives us the reason for such destruction. And there we read, for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Last week we looked at the fact that the word fornication is often used to speak of false religion, of, of unfaithfulness to the true and living God. Uh, the quarterly writer brought out the fact that a relationship with a prostitute is only an imitation of a real relationship, and it's empty of anything real. Um, it might seem to bring pleasure, but in the end, it's not only empty, but potentially very dangerous. Here, the kings of the earth are said to have committed fornication with uh, Babylon, and the merchants of the earth are said to have made a lot of money because of her. Now, governments have long made use of religion to unify and control people. The ancient Romans required emperor worship as a sign of one being dedicated to Rome. During the Middle Ages, the so-called Holy Roman Empire persecuted anyone who would not submit to the Catholic Church. Whether such people were pagan or Christian didn't matter. In fact, a look at human history shows us that whenever religion and government are tied together, persecution of others takes place. After King Henry VIII of England declared himself the only supreme head of the Church of England in 1534, it became illegal for anyone not licensed by the Church of England to preach. Uh, in the 1600s, John Bunyan, the author of A Pilgrim's Progress, was thrown in jail for preaching without being licensed by the Church of England. <clears throat> in the end times, it's clear that false religion will, for a time, be used by the Antichrist's government. But what exactly is that false religion of the end times? Well, what we can know from Scripture is that, first of all, it is false religion. The use of the word Babylon to explain it, to, to explain it is, is a, a pretty description. Um, it will, for a while, be useful to the Antichrist's plan. As I've already said, 
religion has often been used to unify and control people. Probably one of the biggest religious movements of our times is that of uh, ecumenism, uh, the ecumenical movement. Uh, the ecumenical movement has as its goal the unification of all religion. That used to mean that the goal was to unite all Christian denominations as one. Great efforts have been made by the proponents of the ecumenical movement to focus on what we have in common, which no one seems to notice means we must ignore the things on which we do not agree, regardless of what the Bible says. To the people who are adherents of the ecumenical movement, it's more important to have unity than truth. Um, the ecumenical movement has greatly influenced professing Christians to ignore the details of Scripture in favor of unity between different groups. And of course, if a true believer finds that his church has slipped into contradicting God's word, that person, person should heed the words of 2 Corinthians 6, 17, which says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Now, in modern times, the, the Pope, the leader of the Catholic Church, has reached out to include Islam in the ecumenical movement. He has referred to the people of that faith as his Muslim brothers. Uh, it, it doesn't take a detailed knowledge of the differences between Islam and Christianity to know that they are completely incompatible. Nevertheless, the Pope's attitude is attractive to very many people. When the Antichrist's government is established, it will likely take advantage of an extreme ecumenism, uh, embracing all things under the broad umbrella of nominal Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, New Ageism, Wicca, and, and who knows what else. In order to promote such a unity, there will, of course, be a hatred of those who refuse to embrace this smorgasbord of confusion. The groundwork for that is already laid. It's in place. The world we live in now doesn't hate all so-called Christians, only those who actually believe in and try to follow the teachings of the Bible. And we are labeled as haters and, ironically, treated very hatefully by some of those who call us haters. Now, getting back to Revelation, I didn't forget about that. One of the things we're told regarding this false religious system is that <clears throat> the merchants of the earth are wax rich because of her. There's a lot of money that could be made and thus taxed by governments uh, through the sales of religious paraphernalia, including prayer rugs, candles, statues, incense burners, jewelry, and you just go on and on and on. Uh, there have always been people who figured out how to get rich off of religion. And, and the end-time merchants will be no different. And, and in fact, it, it appears they'll do very well for themselves in the worldly way uh, by taking advantage of this. Now, here's something very interesting. Verses 4 and 5 of Revelation 18. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Are we to understand that some true believers in Jesus Christ have become caught up in false religion? Yes. Yes, we, we have to understand it that way. And, and, Actually, that's something that's been going on for a long time. A while back, I read a book written by a man who said he was raised in a Christian home, that he accepted Christ as his Savior at a young age, but never really studied the Bible, and dropped out of church in his young adulthood, and was lured into New Age mysticism by some friends. And since he didn't have a very good understanding of the Bible, he initially assumed that this mysticism was just another way of drawing close to God. 
uh, he was further drawn in and began to get involved with things that were expressly forbidden by the Christian scri scriptures. But he didn't know that because he wasn't familiar with God's word. Eventually, a Christian friend showed him what God's word actually says. And he wisely chose to come out and be separated from that false religion that had lured him in. And he began to serve the Lord. Among young professing Christians today, there are many who look at the ways of this world and say, I don't think God would be against any of this. It's not that important. Uh, many of the older Protestant denominations actually embrace and promote things that are contrary to God's word. One such uh, denomination, uh, or an article uh, in the last year, it has some congregations that incorporate pagan rituals into what they call worship, and the members of such congregations love it. Now, as a pastor, as a Christian, uh, I can't understand how anyone who has truly accepted Jesus Christ could lead others into such blatant falsehood. I am forced by the evidence to conclude that there are many religious leaders today who do not know Jesus Christ as Savior. They are the blind leading the blind. Today, God would say to any and all true believers who might have gotten caught up with any such thing, come out of her, my people. And God will judge all false religion, no matter what it calls itself. Back to Revelation 18, verses 6 through 8. Reward her, <clears throat> even as she rewarded you, and double unto her, double according to, uh, to her works. In the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famines, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. Look at that last part. Strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. Child of God, that's your heavenly Father. Don't feel discouraged by the attacks of false religion. God will deal with it. And he will reward those who are faithful to him. Verses 9 and 10. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. So here we have the world leaders mourning the destruction of end times Babylon. Why? Because they had lived deliciously, and that word deliciously can be translated luxuriously. Uh, they had profited off of all of her falsehoods. Their profit is over with. <clears throat> and of course, that makes them sad. <clears throat> Excuse me. Verses eight, uh, 11 through 13. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen, the purple and silk, the scarlet and all uh, thine wood, and all manner of vessels of ivory and all manner of vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men. Basically, Babylon, this false religion personified, is willing to make money off of anything and everything, including the souls of men. Uh, of course, no human being can have such power, but it has been claimed 
by some people in the past. In the 1400s, a popular sentiment taught by the Catholic Church had a little jingle, and that was, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Uh, first, in addressing this, I want to say that the idea of purgatory, uh, a, a place that's kind of a waiting room for will you, where you'll end up for eternity, that idea, that concept of purgatory has absolutely no scriptural backing at all. Rather, in Luke 16, Jesus teaches clearly that a person's eternal dwelling place is established before, before that person dies, and when they die, they will find themselves there immediately. But what was falsely taught goes far beyond the concept of purgatory back in, in the 1400s. Uh, it was taught... Uh, and it went beyond the 1400s, by the way, but that's when it started. It was taught that the average person did not have the right to pray. Obviously, such a teaching uh, relied on the fact that many people were illiterate. And so they only knew what the uh, representatives of the Catholic Church told them. So they were lied to and told that they didn't have the right to pray. Um, they were also taught that their deceased loved ones were lingering in purgatory and that such people might be prayed out of purgatory. But since the average person wasn't allowed to pray, they were required to go to a priest and pay him to say such a prayer. It was thought that such merchandising was the truth. The average person didn't know that this was a falsehood and they were taken advantage of, of. And it was also through such merchandising that St. Peter's Basilica was built. My point is this, in the past, people have, have not been above making a huge profit off of religious lies. That's still true today, and it will remain true into the time of the Antichrist's kingdom. Revelation 18, 14 through 19. And the fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee, and all things that were dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more at all. The merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, the great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearl, for in one hour... So great riches has come to naught, and every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors, and as many as trade by sea, stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. For in one hour she is made desolate. As these people see the judgment of God fall upon Babylon, all they can talk about is gold and precious stones and pearls and the like. All they see is their loss of monetary profit. As the epitome of false religion is destroyed by God, these people are not saying, who is like the Lord and repenting. They're saying, what city is like this great city? Ironically, at the time they're quoted as saying this, any city standing will be greater than the heap of ruins that they're talking about. That is what will become of all that opposes God. While they are seen as mourning the destruction, we read in verses 20 and 21, Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. <clears throat> and a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. Now, I want to interject here, too, that while much of what we see in uh, end-time Babylon uh, has to do with 
religion. Uh, it also uh, clearly has to do uh, with, with its connection to the ruling government of that time. Um, with that in mind, we can keep in mind that uh, tradition tells us that all of the apostles, with the exception of John, were martyred for their faith by government authority. Um, and Christian persecution isn't over. Sometimes we here in the United States think that since we're not being beheaded or crucified, no one is. But that is happening in the Middle East on a regular basis. People are being cruelly, brutally put to death simply because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And it's not going to stop. Now, let's get back to uh, Revelation 18 and 22 through 24. And the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee, and no craftsman or whatsoever craft he be shall of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee. And the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee, and the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee, for thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived, and in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth." In a sense, this uh, end times Babylon can, can be seen as kind of a picture of most modern day large cities. They embrace and promote anything and everything as good as long as it is profitable. Uh, ecumenism is promoted as good. That is, everyone is encouraged to accept and approve of everything. And this opens up new opportunities for business earnings that, of course, then can be taxed for city revenue. And anyone who does not agree with everything is labor, labeled as a hater and pressured into conforming. See, sadly, people are no longer looking for truth. They're just looking for profit. And they are willing to make whatever compromise is necessary in order to get it. Because that is what the world values today. The world is primed to accept a pluralistic religious system. And many are ready and willing to take advantage of that by marketing anything and everything related to it. Basically, what we see at work in the world today and uh, is just going to get worse can be summed up in the words of 1 Timothy 6.10, for the love of money is the root of all evil. While money is a tool we need in this world, we need to see that it is just that. It is a tool. When it comes to love, let's remember what Jesus said is important. In Matthew 22, starting in verse 37, we read, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Thanks for tuning in today. Hope you have a great day. God bless you.